that, that's an unusual call to worship. We're going to say that. We're going to open up our service this, this evening with 143, This Is My Father's World. We're going to sing all three verses. This is my father's world, and to my listening ears, all nature sings and round me rings the music of the spheres. This is my father's world, I rest me in the thought of rocks and trees of skies and seas his hands the wonders rock this is my father's world the birds their carols raise the morning light the lily white declare the maker's praise this is my father's world he shines in all that's fair in the rustling grass i hear him pass he speaks to me everywhere this is my father's world oh let me ne'er forget that though the seems off so strong God is the ruler yet this is my father's world the battle is not done Jesus who died shall be satisfied and earth and heaven be one pray with me Father God it is truly a joy to witness all that the world declares as the mighty works of your hand. Father, we pray that tonight we'll get another glimpse of your majesty, how you have wrought things that are beyond our imagination, and that as beautiful as this world is, we know that the wrong is uh, often strong, but we know that there's so much more that you have planned for us. Father, I just pray that uh, we will all be excited about being your children, looking forward to what you have in store for us. We pray your blessing upon us this evening as we meet and worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, what a mighty God we serve, 672. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. Angels bow before him. Heaven and earth adore him. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. Angels bow before him. Heaven and earth adore him. What a mighty God we serve. One more time. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. Angels bow before him. Heaven and earth adore him. What a mighty God we serve. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Joanne. Good evening. It's good to have you here this Saturday night, November 13th. No better place to be than right here. And so uh, we're glad to have you. I uh, want to welcome you to tonight's session on dinosaurs, design, and destiny. 
And uh, we're looking uh, forward to hearing Ryan uh, here this evening. Also looking forward to hearing him tomorrow morning. Uh, two more sessions, 8.45 uh, in the morning, our Bible school time, and then 9.45, our morning assembly. And um, again, we are glad that you have made it out and to be with us tonight. I want to mention we have uh, two baskets, this white basket up on the stage and a white basket right back in the back by the sound booth uh, to kind of help uh, with expenses. And if you would like to help support the meeting, that's what those are for. And if you're going to write a check, we want to encourage you to make the check out to the Palmyra Church of Christ. And uh, every bit of that is going to go to Ryan and, and uh, the expenses and things that we have here um, to be able to make this all happen, to make it possible. Also want to mention, if you're interested in a set of DVDs, and in, uh, uh, all five sessions of, of DVDs, um, we're going to offer those for $20. And um, if, you don't, if you're not a member here, um, get a hold of me. Let me know that you want them. You can text me. And let me know, and that way uh, we, we'd be able to get those together for you. But if you're interested, let me just see a show of hands. Kind of just get a feel. Put your hands up nice and high. Don't be shy. Okay, kind of, I'm trying to count real quick. Um, over here on this side. Okay, there's probably about 15 that I'm seeing right now. So um, that will be handy. I mean, handy to re-listen to and to share it with other people as well. Okay, uh, last night, uh, Ryan spoke about the historical figure, a man by the name of Noah. He talked about the deluge, the universal, global, catastrophic flood that took all life that lived on land, other than those who were in the ark. He spoke about the size of the ark, the various kinds of animals, talked about Pangea, uh, plate tectonics, uh, bent rocks, and how that happens. He talked about fossils. Um, he said there were three things, three things that were needed to make fossils. Y'all remember what they were? Number one, mud. mud. Number two, wow. water. Number three, that quickness. That's right. He also hit on the geological column, uh, radiometric dating, carbon-14, and talked a little bit about the Grand Canyon, talked a little bit about Mount St. Helens. We looked at Genesis chapter 7. And also went to Hebrews 11, where the Bible says, By faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear and prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world, and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. And uh, understand this. Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior, believed in Noah. He talked about Noah. And uh, so did a lot of other people, and the Hebrew writer did as well. He is a historical figure. And so we can trust our Bibles. We can trust God's Word. God does not lie. And uh, our God is a God who knows the end from the very beginning. He knows it all. He knows everything. We're glad to have Ryan Cox with us tonight. Welcome him as he comes to share God's Word. Ryan Cox. Did I mention it was my favorite night? <laughs> oh, I'm excited. This is my favorite night of all the nights we get to do all this together. And I thank you once again for the extraordinary opportunity uh, to get to be with you. Uh, this is our, actually, Bob and I were checking our calendar. Uh, this is our uh, final dinosaur event uh, of the year. Uh, and so uh, it has been a tremendously jam-packed year, one of the busiest uh, in, uh, in our ministry's 31 years. Uh, Bob, uh, driving the dinosaurs around, has literally been coast to coast and border to border. Been all the way to uh, um, Ocean Isle Beach in uh, North Carolina, to um, Vancouver, Washington, all the way up to right near uh, Glacier National Park, Montana, and all the way down to Spanish Fort, Alabama on the Gulf Coast. So he has crisscrossed this country multiple times this year, and uh, we are just blessed that the Lord continues to open those kinds of doors. We are going through the worldview of dinosaurs. The very first night, we looked at their creation. We saw that they fit into created kinds. And as part of that review, what is a dinosaur? A reptile. A reptile that does what? Walks? 
Very good. If you are not with us, a dinosaur is a reptile, and the thing that distinguishes it from all other reptiles is that it walks upright on its legs. Although the reptiles do this kind of waddle thing, they have a closed acetabellum, not so with dinosaurs. Uh, the femoral shaft comes up, makes a right angle turn, as you can see in pebbles, the Albertosaurus there, and they walk upright. Even the four-legged ones, their rear legs are upright, and uh, that's how they walk, and that's their distinguishing characteristic. I need you to remember that tonight. As we move through this, we saw last night how dinosaurs fit into the global flood, how the flood is the only very good scientific explanation for the fossil record and the geologic um, layers of strata we see all across the planet. And so tonight, if they were on the ark, then what does that mean dinosaurs did after the ark? got married and had babies. That's right. That's right. That's how we teach with the young people. So tonight we get to look at dinosaurs in history. Again, that's why I say this is my favorite one because that's my background. I, I, I went to school, got my degree in history, love history, taught history for seven years, and now I get to go around and talk about the very best history book that mankind has ever known, and that is the Bible. It is absolutely, I can't tell you how good and reliable and dependable and authentic this history is. It's a testimony to its divinity and to the one who gave us. So, dinosaurs in history. What am I going to be looking for then, post-flood, if I'm searching for dinosaurs in history? Well, I'm going to be looking for depictions and descriptions of what? Yes, and what's a dinosaur? Reptiles that do what? That's exactly right. That's what I'm going to be looking for. Am I going to be searching for the word dinosaur? No, I'm not, okay? Because ancient civilizations all have their own languages, and even in the English language, the word dinosaur didn't come about until 1841, when this man, Sir Richard Owen, is going to go do a presentation before an academic group, and he's going to talk about big, scary reptiles that, of which we found their fossils. But in an academic setting, you don't want to say big, scary reptile. You don't sound very um, educated. So he took two Greek words, dinos and soros, put them together, and I know you're all making jokes about soros right now, but um, dinos and soros, put them together, and it, it came up with the word dinosauria, which literally means big scary reptile, okay? That's what the word means, okay? And so before that word, we did not have the word dinosaur. He publishes in 1842. People begin to learn about this word, dinosaur. But if you did not have the word dinosaur, and you wanted to use a word that described big scary reptile, what word might you use? What was that? Ah, dragons. Latin, Greek, both have this word, dracon, means, guess what? Big scary reptile. That's what it means. And it's very interesting. The all-knowing Wikipedia says that the Greek and Latin term refer to any great serpent reptile, not necessarily mythological. Oh, really? Wasn't well, that interesting? In fact, could you use that word to describe some of these creatures? Absolutely, so much so that if you go to the Indianapolis Children's Museum and you look at Draco Rex and you zoom in on the sign there for it, which is of the Pachycephalosauria kind, what does it say? It's a new type of dinosaur that looks like a what? Dragon. Draco Rex is a Pachy that doesn't have a dome. Could you use the word dragon that would describe that creature? What do you think? Yeah, looks kind of like, mm hmm yeah, kind of like So it's funny, when they have the, they have the uh, question up there, is it a dinosaur or a dragon? My answer to that would be, um, yes. <laughs> Absolutely. So, the word dragon is certainly applicable. Your Bible even has a word for dragon. In the Hebrew, the word is tanin. If you recall, when we were going through 
um, days five and six on our first night together, looking at the creation of dinosaurs. On day five, one of the descriptions of the creatures there, the marine reptiles, it says all the fish and even the great sea monsters or sea creatures, your Bible might translate it. The word there for monsters or creatures is the word tanin. Say tanin. Tanin. That means, guess what? Big scary reptile. There you go. And it comes from the root word tan, which means elongated monster, big, long, scary reptile. Each civilization is going to have its own words or descriptions of big scary reptiles, and that's exactly what we find. In your old King James, they even used to translate that word as dragon. Because in the English, that was the best word, especially in the Old English, that they had for big, scary reptile. And that's what the word means. And your Bible goes on to give many, many descriptions of many, many of them. Serpent, uh, the serpentine reptilian creatures that live in water, on land, and even they have a different word for flying ones, seraphs in the Hebrew, which is the root word for our word that we use as seraphim which always have a reptilian-like description, flying reptiles. So you have water reptiles, land reptiles, and flying reptiles in your Bible with their own Hebrew words to describe them. Let's take a look at two specific ones the Bible addresses. As God takes Job through a tour of creation, he shows him 12 different creatures. Two of those have been deemed somewhat mysterious by people, sometimes who haven't taken the time to really study it. In fact, some would even say they're mythological. And I say, really, were you there to know that? I mean, how, how can you say from this ancient document that those two are mythical creatures, but the other ten are real? Does that sound reasonable? Does that logic? No. No. Is it something that he saw in person? Yes. Gives incredible detailed descriptions of it. Doesn't sound made up at all. Is it possible it just may be something that's since gone extinct since Job's lifetime? In Job chapter 4, do we have the first one? Behemoth. If you want to turn there and look at it, you can. If you want to make some little uh, you know, highlights, some underlines, notes, some notes there regarding it, you'll see very interesting descriptions of this particular big scary reptile called the behemoth. Who's heard that before? Behemoth. Okay, behemoth. Has some very interesting details given about it. It, first of all, eats grass. What does that mean? Herbivore, okay, so we're looking for an herbivore, very good. Strength in the loins, muscles in the belly. This thing has an incredible muscular structure around its legs and hips. I wonder what it would need those for. Maybe to walk how? Ah, uh-huh, okay. It has a stiff tail like a cedar, like a cedar. Usually when the Bible talks about cedars, the reference is to the cedars of Lebanon, Big, massive, huge trees. Solomon used those for what? Construction of the temple. Yes, exactly. And so, it has bones like bronze, limbs like bars of iron. Incredible skeletal structure. And in fact, the bones like bronze, it seems like tubes of bronze. This thing might have... Bones that have hollow parts to them. Because of how massive this skeletal structure is, it would need that in order to be able to withstand its own weight, its own mass. That's a very interesting description it gives there. Lives in reeds and marsh, walks through turbulent rivers with no problem, and is first amongst God's works. To me, that says, okay, this is the biggest ever. This is number one. The biggest, largest, most gargantuan animal to walk the surface of earth to show forth the mighty power of our creator. And that's what Job gets to see here. Do we have any herbivores that have massive muscle and skeletal structures 
that are the largest creatures on the planet and have a tail like a massive cedar tree from Lebanon. So what was that? Sauropod! Man, somebody paid attention the first night. All right, that's good. He's like, I wouldn't even hear. Anyway, so... Sauropods, yes. If you were to go to Oklahoma University, the Sam Noble Museum, we have one called the Apatosaurus there. Its tail goes all the way out and around like that. Comes there right like that. In fact, that tail is five feet thick and up to 30 feet long. Would you say that match? And that's without any muscles, tendons, tissue, skin, nothing. Just bone. Would you say that would meet the description of a massive tree of Lebanon? Of Lebanon? Yes, I would think so. One of those big cedars. Absolutely. Okay. Now, if you have your Bible open there and you're looking down in the non-inspired footnotes, we all understand that, right? The footnotes are someone's opinion, someone's thoughts, someone's commentary. Okay. What are some of the suggestions given there as to what this creature is? Hippopotamus. Yes. Because that has a massive tail like a cedar tree, right? No. No? That doesn't make very much sense, does it? No. no, it doesn't. No. That makes as much sense as being an OSU fan, right? <laughs> I was given cash and maple syrup to say that tonight. <laughs> I was told that was the number one fan thing here. No? Oh, my. I was talking about Oklahoma State University, but I don't know. Anyway. OH! Oh, okay, now I'm on their good side. Okay, here we go. <laughs> I'm not getting invited back. Um, the biggest one, someone, someone, usually a young person comes by and say, what's the biggest dinosaur ever discovered? I say, I'm going to show you on my favorite night. Here it is. This is the Patago Titan in the Chicago Field Museum. They just put it up on display uh, a, couple months ago, or a couple years ago, and uh, that's me right there beside it. Would you say this creature meets the description of what we're seeing here? Yes. Is it the absolute largest one that has ever walked the planet? I don't know. It's the biggest one we've found thus far. 122 feet long, up to 70 tons. 70 tons. There have been some that have been suggested possibly a little longer, like the Argentinosaurus, maybe 130, 140 feet. But when you add in the actual size of the bones and everything, they're just, this thing is incredible. It's mass and everything. Uh, some of the uh, thickness right here of the tail is six feet. As tall as me. Uh, the, this, is, this is all research level replica, okay? Here are some of the actual uh, bones. Some of the femurs, tibias, that kind of stuff right there. Here's a close-up of them. You can see how these are bigger than the people standing beside them. Okay? It's looking up into the second story there. This thing is gargantuan. It's very interesting about these creatures that um, some of their bones have a little bit of hollow-type chambers in them, like tubes of bronze in order to withstand it. They have these arch shapes to their, to their hips and to their uh, vertebrae in order to support their massive weight. And what do they eat? Grass. Okay, now see, here's the thing. When we would make the claim that it's a behemoth, they would laugh at us that when we would say it's a sauropod because they're like, oh, pff, well, those things lived uh, millions of years ago, 101.6 million years ago, and grass hadn't evolved yet, so you're just foolish by saying that. <laughs> Until they grabbed one of these things. Everybody remember what this is from last night? Coprolite? The dino poo? Okay. They found one that they believed was associated with a sauropod. Cut it open to examine its contents, you know, to get some uh, insight into the vegetation of its time. And guess what was inside? Grass. Guess what they had to do to all of their charts as to when the evolution of grass took place? Oh, don't you love it? Ooh, it's so good. So... If that's what's being described here in the book of Job, what should I then expect to find, hope to find then, 
In other ancient civilizations, depictions of what? Say sauropods. Sauropods, long neck, long tail creatures that walk how? Guess what we find? We go to uh, Asia, modern-day Iraq, to Sumer, dating around 2000 BC. This is a cylinder seal that an official would use and would, would roll it out. See, like that, you roll it out, and it would create this little seal here. And look at what's on the seal when you do that. Long necks, long tail, some pretty big flying creatures as well. And how are they walking? Upright on their legs, isn't that interesting? Pretty good muscular, muscular structure there as well. And what are they doing with their necks? They're twisting, them. They're twisting them. They're intertwining them. Yeah, that's interesting. We go up into Europe. In the Cairo Museum, if you have the chance to visit Egypt, you walk in, and the centerpiece of that museum, as soon as you walk in, Encased in this, this plexiglass or whatever is something called the Narmer Plate. Narmer Plate is about King Narmer, who's believed to be the first one to be able to reign over both Upper and Lower Egypt, to unite the two and reign over them all together. And this plate is what um, is the great uh, tribute to him. And on one side of it, it's interesting, the tour guide took everybody on the other side. I went on the, the opposite side because I wanted to see it. Here's a little enhanced version so you can see a little better. Long necks, long tails look a little short in there as they got them curly cute. And how are they walking? Upright on their legs. Isn't that interesting? And what are they doing with their necks? Time to twist them again, kind of intertwining them. Exactly. We go, that was in Asia. That was in Asia, down in Egypt. We go back up to Europe now. And on our third continent, we go to um, Bishop Bell's burial plot within the Carlisle Cathedral. And there are several different animals on it. And it's in this book here that we carry. All these other creatures, uh, bronze uh, engravings there, of a bat and a fish and a dog and a bird. But down there at the bottom part right there where that red circle is, are these two creatures right here. Uh, interesting. And, and what are they? Sauropods. Uh, sauropods. Long neck, long tail creatures that are walking how? Upright on their legs. Upright on their legs. And, and what are they doing with their, with their necks? Twisting them again. Twisting them again. I'd shown these pictures uh, many times uh, in places I'd gone, and and somebody came up to me once, uh, several years ago now, and said, you realize what we got here? And I said, yeah, I know, we got sauropod dinosaurs on three different continents. And he's like, no, 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 do you realize what we have here? And I said, the, what? And he said, we just don't have depictions of sauropods. We have depictions of observed behavior. <laughs> Pick, huh? I'm not going to scream. I'm not going to yell. I'm, I was, whew. You know how excited I was about that? What's the only explanation for this? They must have walked together. must have seen these things to make these types of depictions, of observed behavior of these types of creatures. It's incredible. So we have very good evidence from the fossil record that support the description in Job, and we have very good evidence evidence from outside of scripture and outside of science in history to support this record and to support the biblical worldview of walking with these creatures. Let's talk about the other one now. The Leviathan. Oh, this one's fun. Because this is the one that has just always been kind of like, what is this thing? We've had different ideas. I mean, it, it, you can't catch it with a fish hook. That means it lives where? It spends most of its time where? In water, it is terrifying, mighty strength, splendid frame, strong scale, so it's reptilian. Um, terror around the teeth, could eat iron like straw, bronze like rotten wood. Its back is made of road shields that clasp together, these scales do that. Um, which doesn't sound like a fish type creature, that it would have gills. Um, flames? Come from its mouth. Ooh. Smoke comes from. Oh! Oh, what, what is that? 
fi fire breathing, oh, oh no. Fire breathing dragon, the but oh, they're going to make fun of us. They're going to say we believe in scary fire breathing dragon, that we're just a bunch of kooky people. Oh my goodness. Next we'll be rooting for Michigan. <laughs> so no, no. <laughs> I'm just digging my hole deeper, aren't I? <laughs> Dean Jackson's here, he'll get me out of it. Strong neck, heart like a millstone, leaves a big wake when it swims. That kind of tells me it's not going to be a, a deep water creature. Because you would see it as it's kind of moving through the water as well. What is this? All kinds of different ideas. Um, you know, we've seen like Lo Nessie, Loch Ness Monster or something like that. Or maybe a big a Mosasaur over here. This thing's got some terror around its teeth. In fact, it's got 74 teeth. And if you look closely at it, back underneath, back here in his throat, are a good number of teeth as well. Because one of the ideas is his jaw, the way it's hooked up, could possibly dislocate a little bit like a snake to swallow bigger prey. And those teeth back there would help push the prey back. Just fun thing. So I mean, that was that was a good possibility. But it, what good is what good does fire breathing do to a creature like that that lives purely underwater? You know, that not not just always things that didn't add up, that didn't make sense until earlier this year. We got a new contender. If you're looking there in Job 41 down the footnotes, what's one of the suggestions it gives? Crocodile. Alligator, crocodile, some type of crocodilian creature. And I always looked at that and I just, I just laughed. I just laughed. Because I've been to Florida a few times. Anybody by chance ever been to Gatorland down in Florida? Okay, some of you have been there. Okay, you go to Gatorland and you get to see all these gators, really neat, and they do all these demonstrations. Then they have a little show and you go sit in the little amphitheater there. And they, 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 the guy will go down into the water, grab one of the gators by the tail, drag it up here, sit it on here, do little demonstrations, make it open its mouth, you know, and do all these kind of fun things. And then after the show, you can go down, get in a little line there, and you send your child in with him. He takes your child, sits him on the gator, steps back and says, take a picture, and you pay him money for that. <laughs> that that did, just didn't scream Leviathan to me, does it you? No. no. But remember, in the fossil record, many of the things that we have alive today are found there. They're just way, way bigger We've got a whole book on that in there called Monumental Monsters. Anybody here ever heard of Sarcosuchus? Sarcosuchus, that's a, this big, giant, nasty crocodile. Extinct species of crocodile. Cool thing about it is, that's the size of Sarcosuchus. It's fifth on the list. Dinosuchus is the biggest one. That's a, this is a six-foot person here. How would you like to meet that guy in the water? Okay. Dr. Brian Thomas of ICR published uh, an article about it because new research had been, peer-reviewed um, description of this fossil had been released. And he's like, this is very interesting. We ought to look into this. And so I did. And we start looking at the descriptions given by Job of Leviathan. And we see that there are strong scales with its, making its back like a row of shields. In the description of the Dinosuchus, they talked about how this creature had unusually large osteoderms, huge, huge scales. that You could just kind of line them up and clasp them together, like make a row of shields. Big, massive, it just really stood out to the researchers about this creature. It talks about how he has terror around the teeth, could eat iron like straw, bronze like rotten wood. You remember T-Rex? has the strongest bite force of any land animal that's ever walked the planet, okay? More than e even dinosaurs that are bigger than him, his bite force is stronger than theirs. So he, I, to me, he's the toughest guy, T-Rex is. There was a creature, though, that has a strong, remember, his is 12,800 PSI bite force. Megalodon, who knows what Megalodon is? Shark? Okay. Bite force of 24,000 pounds up to, here, you can pass that one around, up to 24,000 pounds. Any stronger than that, it would crush its own jaw. 
Sarcosuchus had a PSI of around 18,000 PSI. So it was in between. Dinosuchus now, they've measured it. It's possible it's up to 24,000 PSI. Strongest of any creature, any creature to ever live on planet Earth. It's tied for first. Would you say that would be terror around the teeth? That thing could literally eat iron like straw and bronze like rotten wood with that kind of pressure. But what about that whole flames from them and smoke from them? Oh my goodness. The whole fire breathing thing. Have we ever scientifically observed fire breathing? Shake your head like this. Maybe you haven't personally, but scientists have. Check out this little creature called the bombardier beetle. Uh, do we have sound? No sound? Uh oh. We had sound the other night. Well, I can narrate while we figure that out. Okay, so the bombardier beetle is this neat little insect here that you can see they got a hold of it here. And scientists have studied this thing at like Cornell University and many other places. And uh, it's fascinating. It, it shoots this stuff out from his rear end. And um, it's, uh, it's, it's an enigma for evolutionists as they try to figure out exactly how this thing works. So he has these two chambers in here that uh, mixes chemicals together and then puts them down into this uh, firing chamber, this asbestos, like asbestos line firing chamber, and um, mixes them together. And when it does it, it causes a reaction and it shoots it out. Okay? Um, so, watch here what happens when it does that. What does that look like? Fire breathing. That's pretty cool, all righty. And the way it does this, it's called a gas flash vapor. It's about 212 degrees, foul-smelling liquid, partial gas flash vapor, okay? Has these two chambers, mixes them together, okay? Um, is there something, uh, Dwayne, that I need to do or something I can do to help fix that? Just curious. Are we... Okay, sounds good. Uh, if we need to plug into it, we can. I've got... We can plug in uh, on the side there into the... Uh, Headphone jack or whatever it says. Because I have several more videos. <laughs> Just letting you know. Anyway, so um, this is incredible. What's really funny is when they try to explain how do you evolve that. Because if you just evolve one part at a time, what's going to happen? It's going to blow itself up. And he shows that even it does it in a rapid succession even so that way it can hold on with its feet. It's not just one big blast. It's actually lots of little sequential ones. Okay, So we have two chambers mixing chemicals together to give us a gas flash vapor. All right. Now then. Um, I need to advance my slide. <laughs> can we uh, advance my slide there real quick? Working on it. There, oh, there it is. Look at that. So, Leviathan, or Leviathan, maybe, possibly, as they look into this, notice what we find here. Look at this nose. He has four nostrils. Unlike any other one of these types of creatures they have ever found. The two top ones, he breathes with. The front two, with these two chambers on the direct front, they have no idea what they are for. It's interesting, you read the paper. Based on its enormous skull, it looked like neither an alligator nor a crocodile. Its snout was long and broad, but inflated at the front around the nose in a way not seen in any other crocodilian living or extinct. The reason for its enlarged nose is unknown. It had two large holes present at the tip of the snout in front of the nose. Right there at the mouth, at the nose, this stuff would come out. It's interesting. We go back and we look at the actual description there with Leviathan. And what does it actually say? It's snorting, throws out flashes of light, sparks of fire, smoke, like a boiling pot. Gas flash vapor. Exactly as has been scientifically observed. And before we ever saw it in the laboratory, your Bible described it in perfect detail. How amazing is your Bible? Pretty cool, huh? We got it? Fantastic. All right. Now, 
multi-headed though. They're like, oh, so you believe in multi-headed fire-breathing dragons? Well, not necessarily, but does multi-headedness happen from time to time? Yes. Can you imagine if you saw a birth defect in one of these and he had two heads? Would that not be worth a story? Yeah. Pretty crazy stuff. So, you start looking for these types of things in ancient civilizations. You start looking for creatures that walk upright on their legs. Or meet descriptions of other types of extinct creatures that we find. As that would all help support the biblical record. Like this one in Italy. Around 1000 BC, they found these clay figurines after a landslide. And it's got these rows of shields on the back and four spikes on the tail. What would that seem to be? Stegosaurus. I mean, even down to the correct number of spikes. That's pretty cool. You can go over to Utah. And on this mud stain, as they try to say it is, you see this creature that has a long neck and a long tail. This is the ant's version. And its legs are what? Upright. Isn't that fascinating? You go to um, Australia, where a missionary named Dennis Fields was working with the Kukuilanji people. And he's sitting there having conversation with them, and they tell him about the Yaharu. And how this creature out in the water one day swallowed a little girl, and it was very sad and everything. He's like, oh my, that's crazy. I wonder what that thing looked like. And they said, well, the tribal artist can make you a picture. He's like, okay, that's cool. So he does, brings it to Dennis Fields. And he's just a little bit floored by the depiction. Gives its answers in Genesis for them to have. Because they show him this reptilian-like creature with this long neck, four flippers, the skeletal structure, the digestive system, and even the little girl inside. And what does that thing look like? Exactly. Plesiosaurus. They get up to 49 feet. One had a skull of nine feet. Could that swallow a little girl? No problem. They're not supposed to find things like that. Because that thing was supposed to go extinct millions and millions of years Oh my. You go to Cambodia, to this place called Te Prom, the temple there, built in the late 1100s. And as you walk around through the incredible uh, structure there, you walk back here, you find this column that has all kinds of animals on it, and it has these ones right here. In fact, what does that one right there look like? Yeah, it's a creature that has shields on the back. What? And walks how? Upright. upright on its legs. Do we have a creature that walks upright on its legs, has shields on the back? Yeah, what would that be? Stegosaurus. Stegosaurus, that's right. But it, it, it looks a little weird, doesn't it? it, it, it see, see the mouth right here? Eyeball. And then this cone that looks like it's part of, like it's over its head and has this little ring on it. And it's always like, what is that? That's so weird. Until 2017, when a guy named David Woodsell, we have his book out there called Chronicles of Dinosauria, and has many of these things that I'm showing you in it tonight. Um, he went on the inside doing research and study, and something caught his eye. He took pictures of it, and then finally realized what he had. It was the same creature from outside. And here it was, upright on its legs. Here it is, here it is outlined for you. Has shield, two rows of shields on its back. And right there where that ring is, it looks like there's some type of harness on it. You despike that tail, you think that thing could pull some stuff for you? Hmm. What's interesting about that, as he points out in his research, and as people try to, to debunk it, like this guy, Glenn Cuban, it's a very interesting. I took these from his website, all four of these pictures, from his own website. Guy trying to say, it's not a dinosaur, it's not a stegosaurus, it's either a rhinoceros or a chameleon. And I looked at that and I said, well, you know, the guy's got a point, you know. Rhinoceros, chameleon, I get those two confused all the time, you know. I'm just like... The same time that temple was built, you go up and you look at the ancient Chinese records. And for centuries, going all the way back to 1600 BC, you have the positions of royal dragon feeder. 
You have the Song Dynasty Emperor who's raised dragons within his palace compound, big, large reptiles. You have the Huangdi mythic yellow emperor who was said to make sacrifices at the summit of Taishan after driving there in a chariot harness to six large reptiles. These date from the exact same time. The record of big, large reptiles pulling chariots and a depiction just south of there of a stegosaurus that is harnessed. I think that's just a little coincidence. Marco! All right, still awake. That's good. He goes to China a hundred years later to the province of Karazhan. And he writes this, leaving the city of Yachi and traveling 10 days into a westerly direction, you reach the province of Karazhan, which is also the name of its chief city. Here are seen huge serpents, huge reptiles, 10 paces in length, 10 spans in the girt of the body. At the forepart, near the head, they have two little bitty arms. Really? Having three claws, which are claws like those of a tiger, with eyes, eyes larger than a four-penny loaf and very glaring. The jaws are wide enough to swallow a man, and the teeth are large and sharp. And their whole appearance is so formidable that neither man nor any kind of animal can approach them without terror. He goes on to describe all these details about it, about how they track them down, about how it might eat some of the livestock or whatever, that the dogs were even scared of them, everything like that. And so how they would go to try to trap one of these, if it was getting too close to the village or whatever, is they would go and they'd dig this little hole in there and they'd stick a, a spike, a spear, a top of a spear down in and cover it all up as he'd be walking to the water hole and he'd step on it and it'd pierce through his foot and he'd be almost immobilized and while he can't walk around very well, they would come and pounce on it and, and do him in and kill him and then they would butcher it and they would use all the internal organs for all kinds of stuff, medicines, salves, all kinds of stuff and the meat, oh my goodness. You talk about the finest delicacy in all the land. Anybody ever had like gator tail? Succulent, juicy flavor? All oh my, that doesn't even hold a candle to this creature. It's fantastic. Don't you want to try it? Right. Well, Marco Polo said it was the best in all the land. What is he describing here? Well, let's take a look at the details. He says, it's a big, giant reptile, big, scary reptile, huge head, big old honking eyes, like four penny loaves, he said. The thing is around 25 feet in length, and this big, giant thing has two little, little bitty arms with sharp claws. What are we describing here? What do you think? Everybody usually says what? T-Rex, right? Everybody thinks T-Rex there, okay? Everybody thinks, theropod, no doubt, okay? But look at the details. How many claws does a Tyrannosaur have? Two. How many does this one have, Marco Polo? Three. You look at the details. So we're looking for a creature around 25 feet long, reptilian theropod that has three claws. Anything like that ever been found in the fossil record? Allosaurus. They have how many claws? Three, and they average 28 feet long. Some say Marco Polo exaggerated his stories, and he very well may have, and probably did on some of them. But isn't it interesting how in this particular circumstance, his exaggeration just happened to match the exact detailed description of an Allosaurus? What are the odds? Hmm. This goes on and on and on. This re researcher, Vance Nelson, somebody asked me, what's your favorite book on the table? This is it, because I'm biased to the history stuff, okay? And Vance Nelson uh, went about collecting for several years depictions from all across the world of these creatures that walk upright on their legs and are reptilian-like and have been made all these depictions. And he brought them back home to America, and then he went to a professional computer generation company. Make, they make depictions of dinosaurs for things like National Geographic, Discovery Channel, History Channel, whatever, for movies and television shows. And he said, can you make me a bunch of dinosaurs? They're like, sure. He's like, um, okay, can you make it, uh, when I give you one, can you make it this color? And like, sure, absolutely. He said, and can you put it in these positions, but anatomically correct? Based on our understanding of the fossils, how would it look if it was in this position in that color? He then brought them home and put them side by side and made this whole book called Dire Dragons. This is my favorite one. 
That's a Chinese dragon. What's very interesting about all of these depictions and descriptions is that, you know, as we're going through the history of fossil discoveries, the first actually identified as a dinosaur fossil discovery, we've been finding them long before that, but identified as such, was until 1824. Richard Owen doesn't come up with the name until 1841, and the first time we actually try to put one of these together and fail miserably at it, turns out like this was 1854, yet in every single one of these depictions, how accurate are they? Spot on. What's the only logical, rational explanation for this when we haven't found any fossils during those times? Do they have a natural history museum to go to? What's the only explanation? They saw them with their own eyes. The only reason to have a problem with that is if your worldview won't allow you to believe the actual evidence. How many worldviews are there? Biblical and non-biblical. Where is your worldview tonight? So we have seen lots of details here regarding these things along about the three points of a biblical worldview and all this evidence that absolutely supports it to be 100% true, as if we ever thought it would turn out otherwise. Well, that'd be nice, that'd be fun, good time to have a conclusion. But there's a question young people always ask. Well, if they were living after the flood... Where are they now? What happened to them? They probably died. died. (laughs) Yes. It's very sad, isn't it? (laughs) Yeah. Not a good... They've gone extinct. What happened to them? What's the the usual idea of what killed the dinosaurs? What is it? What is it? Asteroid, 65 million years, is now 66 point something, whatever. They keep... You know, the old asteroid came down. It's always interesting. Have you ever read those things? Have you ever read those, those stories about the asteroid killing the dinosaurs? It's very interesting. I even pulled up, um, I, I should put this in my slide. Um, I got a government-issued uh, study guide for, for young people about teaching the extinction of it, and it lists all the animals that went extinct during this asteroid. What are the only animals that go extinct when the asteroid hits? Dinosaurs. Kills nothing else, just dinosaurs. That's a very picky asteroid, isn't it? How do you explain that? Guess what? I got to find out one time. I was taking my family. They'd come to visit in Oklahoma, and we're going through the uh, museum there, Sam Nolan Museum in Oklahoma University, and the fantastic fossil display, okay? Lots of fantastic fossils. And there, one of the curators was there, and she's kind of following us around because there's nobody else in the museum at that time. And, and she's telling us her entire life story of paleontology. And uh, Okay, that, I did whatever. Well, we come around the corner to this spot where there's this kind of booklet thing that opens and has this thing about the asteroid killing the dinosaurs. And she said, would you like to know how the asteroid killed the dinosaurs? I said, I sure would. All the kids went on. My father-in-law stood there and listened to it. He can hold his hand up in court testimony. This is what she told us. She said, well, you know there was this big asteroid that was heading towards, towards the Earth. I said, I've heard that. She said, okay, well, it comes down and it strikes there near Mexico and creates this massive shockwave like gobs and gobs and gobs of nuclear bombs going off. I said, this sounds terrifying. And it kills everything with certain 100-mile radius, just incinerates it off. I was like, oh, my lands, that sounds like a movie. And she said, it gets even worse. She said, the debris goes all up in the atmosphere and encircling the entire planet. I said, what is going to happen? She said, what happens when things come down through the atmosphere? And I said, well, I've seen the movies and all the space landing stuff. It catches fire. She says, that's right. So now you have these millions and millions of debris of raining down meteorite parts that are catching fire. So you have all these fiery darts, projectiles coming at all life on Earth. I said, hide the children. (laughs) All 
of the animals saw this, ran, hid in their holes and caves in the ground, except for the dinosaurs, who are like good Oklahomans when there's a tornado, went outside and said, ooh, let's watch. (laughs) And therefore killed only the dinosaurs because they weren't smart enough to go get in their holes and caves in the ground. That is the university-level explanation for the selectivity of the asteroid extinction. You think I'm exaggerating that? Check it out from um, Smithsonian. The asteroid was six miles wide, weighing hundreds of billions of tons. Still, compared to Earth, it was tiny. How could it wreak such havoc? It would have hit at nearly 50,000 miles per hour. The energy released would be equal to about 100 million nuclear bombs. huge mass of superheated debris would have been blasted into space, orbiting the Earth before raining back down. The Alvarezes thought the dust could have blocked out the sun for years, devastating life. This was the hypothesis for how the age of dinosaurs ended. There it is. It's the same story. This story has so many problems with it that many other theories have had to be proposed as to what happened to the dinosaurs. You go to the website called Dinopedia, it'll list 22 extinction uh, theories that have been proposed. Uh, of course, there's that one. Let me just give you a few of my favorite ones. Like this one, published in um, 2012 by History Channel when they did an episode of Ancient Aliens that aliens came down and um, brought a virus that turned into a pandemic that killed only the dinosaurs. I'm not making any comments about that at all. All right. Uh, another, another idea is that they did genetic manipulations on the dinosaurs that eventually killed them. Okay. Uh, this one <laughs> is from... Oh, my thing's not updating here. Uh, hold on a second. The idea is, I can't give you the name of the person here. Uh, the idea is a um, caterpillars came along and ate only the vegetation that dinosaurs eat. So all the plant eaters went extinct. And then the meat eaters had nothing to eat. And so just, just dinosaurs go extinct on that one. This one that was proposed was that the dinosaurs developed cataracts and therefore couldn't see to either find food or a date for Friday night. And so they all went extinct on that one. Uh, This was proposed by my colleague, Bob. Okay. (laughs) Makes as much sense as the other ones. And then all the young people's favorite, Researchers, and again, I, I got the names. Um, researchers developed a, a, this mathematical formula of how much methane gas just the sauropods would produce, just the sauropods, and determined that it was enough based on their diet that they literally, them, and then you add in all the rest of the dinosaurs, literally, with the methane they produced, could literally have flatuated themselves to death. And I'm thinking, why would we want to give this up for that? Let me show you something a little better than that. Berkeley says, there has been no settlement to the issue so far, and no clear one is foreseeable. The main problem is the issue of the selectivity of the mass extinction. Some organisms were wiped out, while others were unaffected. Other major problems with the issue are that it is not easy to prove test causation, and that... Most of the ages of the rocks that different evidence comes from are 
questionable. I about fell out of my chair when I read that. Berkeley announcing that radiometric dating of rocks is questionable and unreliable. I showed you all that last night. Couldn't believe it. So they said, ultimately, we just don't know yet for sure. So when you go to a museum, you go to a class, you read a textbook that says, we know that an asteroid killed a dinosaur 66 million years ago. It's a worldview. It's indoctrination. Here's a much, much better explanation that fits the observational evidence. You ever heard of the Ice Age? One Ice Age in a biblical worldview, it is the direct result of the flood. The flood causes the one and only Ice Age. Because, remember, the descriptions we get from the flood, and we're talking about 30%, 30% of the surface, okay, is covered with snow and ice. Um, all that volcanic activity, what is that going to do to the oceans? It's going to warm them up. What does water do when it gets warm? It evaporates. So you're going to have massive amounts of moisture up in the atmosphere. Secondly, what does a volcano do to the sky? It darkens it. Back around 1815 or so was Mount Tambora in Indonesia. It's the largest observed uh, volcano in history. That one volcano, look it up, the, the year without a summer, okay? Um, that one volcano lowered the entire global temperature by one and a half degrees. Just one. Can you imagine if they're all going off, as in the flood, as we saw last night? All that tephra, all that ash out there is going to block out sunlight. So you have all this moisture in the air, goes over the continents, and what's it do? It rains, but it's cold, especially in the higher latitudes. And so what kind of precipitation are we going to get? Snow. Then come summer, what's going to happen? Ah, uh, the temperature has been lowered greatly. What's going to happen? It's not going to melt, or not very much. So now the next winter comes along, and snow's on top of that. What just happened to the amount of snow? It just doubled. It just got much more. Doesn't melt the following year. Keeps building, 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 until it starts packing these things down, and you all of a sudden have ice sheets. This goes on for three to 500 years in the models when you put the data in. Peaks at about 500 years later, and you have about 30% of the planet covered in snow and ice. Then it finally starts to wrap. As all that tephra and ash over several centuries finally goes away enough, you start having your kind of regular seasons then. It starts melting a little bit of that ice cap. It starts flowing into the oceans. What's it going to do to the temperature of those oceans? Finally start cooling down. They believe that up in Siberia in the Arctic Ocean, you could go swimming in the ocean back during the Ice Age. Because that's how warm the water was. This, uh, this all plays big time into the woolly mammoths and all that stuff, but I don't have time for that right, right now. I'll tell you about that later. It's interesting, Job, written around the time of Abraham, right during the peak of all this stuff, in the Middle East, talks about ice, frost, Snow, water becoming hard like stone. He talks more about storehouses of more than any other book of the Bible. Just happens to be during that time. So important was this, we put it on a timeline so you could see how this pans out during that time. And all the areas like the Sahara Desert would have been lush, lush, because of the precipitation going on at that time. In a secular model, ice ages, what is cold air moist or dry? How many of you got your chapstick with you? It's dry. They can't explain that. They can't explain how to get the moisture up there to keep building this stuff. It just all falls apart with a secular model. The biblical model, it explains this perfectly. Sahara Desert's nice and lush. The Middle East is nice and lush. How is the promised land described during Moses' time? Land flowing with milk and honey. Today, that whole southern half, it's desert. Not so when Moses was there. It's because of these conditions. When this ends, you start having massive droughts that happen. And it ends right here when this guy named Isaac has a son named Jacob. And Jacob has to move his family to Egypt. Why? Famine in the land. 
which is exactly what the biblically based Ice Age models show us would have happened. Don't you love your Bible? Love it when stuff like that happens. So what happened to the dinosaurs? Obviously, these big, what kind of animals? Reptiles do not like northern, Oklahoma, or northern Ohio climate. They like it tropical, right? Because it energizes their body, helps their metabolism, because they need that as cold-blooded creatures. They're going to live in areas where it's warm for them to live. Well, when you look through all of the data and historical record stuff, you see that since the Ice Age, we've had warming periods, cooling periods, warming periods, cooling periods, warming periods, cooling periods, and around 1850, we started having a warming period again, but in the last 20 years, it's really plateaued off, and now we're not sure if we're getting ready to enter into a cooling period again, or what exactly. Guess where we find records of dinosaurs? You go back through and you look at all of these, the locations and dates that we find them match up almost perfectly with where we see the warm climates during that time where they could survive. Just another one of those coincidences. But over time, you start, you start cataloging this stuff, it gets fewer and fewer and fewer and fewer until the very, very last records we see of any of these creatures is about the time of Columbus. And there's just barely any records we're seeing around that time. They're about all gone. It's amazing they lasted that long. It's phenomenal. We shouldn't be surprised because we're all the time seeing creatures go extinct. Just within the last 100, 150 years, lots and lots of different species of animals gone extinct. Okay? So, got time for one little quick thing? Okay, this is, I might get a little excited about this. Okay, Th this is it. This is the last thing, okay? This is it, all right? Because there's something they found in these dinosaur fossils that I really want you to see. Because this has turned the paleontology community on its head. And they don't know what to do with this. Okay, these creatures, we're supposed to have died 65, 66 million years ago, which is in direct contrast to the biblical worldview that they were created 6,000 years ago, were on the ark 4,300 years ago, and then survived with all the evidence we saw there. But everything that was telling them they're millions and millions of years old got all upheaved in 2005 when something was discovered in a dinosaur bone. Check this out. practice of breaking dinosaur bones apart and sending the insides to Mary Schweitzer has landed the two of them at the center of one of the biggest controversies paleontology has seen in years. It started back in 2000 with a series of coincidences. A member of Jack's team, Bob Harmon, wandered away from a dig site one day to eat lunch and noticed a small piece of bone sticking out of the side of a 50-foot cliff. I could tell pretty much what it was from where I was sitting. That it was a T-Rex metatarsal. How was it sticking out? You mean it was a side? Here's a cliff, and it was like a little jutting out? Yep, exactly. He got a folding chair, and he stacked it on these rocks right there. And you can see that this is on the sheer side hill of a cliff. Here he this was. is not possible. No, is he attached to anything? No, he's not. That's Bob. Jack named the T-Rex B-Rex in Bob's honor and made the decision to dig it out. But this was under 50 feet of rock. I mean, this was in a terrible place. There was no road to it. There was no access to it. And so for the next three summers, we sent out climbing crews, three people summers. that could repel down cliffs with jackhammers. I mean, it was a horrendous undertaking. The site was so remote that bones had to be lifted out by helicopter. But the giant cast containing B-Rex's thigh bones was too heavy. The chopper couldn't get it off the ground. Couldn't lift so after out. all that excavating, Jack gave the order to cut one of B-Rex's femurs in two. One of these bones now that there. was heartbreaking. No, well, not really. I mean, get a chance to see inside. He shipped the bone fragments that fell out to Mary Schweitzer. So she calls you up and she, she says... calls up and says, <gasps> we have medullary bone. Oh. Now, this had to be thrilling. Yes, very, very exciting. And that wasn't all. What happened next happened by mistake. Mary put some fragments of the bone in acid to dissolve away the outermost layer of mineral. But the acid worked too fast, and all the mineral dissolved away. Being a fossil, 
there should have been nothing left. But there was, and it was elastic, like living tissue. This is the piece. <gasps> no. the T-Rex bone. She showed us video she took under the microscope. That's really what happened? Yes. That's the dinosaur yeah. bone? Without mineral now. That's what was left. It looked like the soft tissue she would have expected to find if it had been modern bone. Oh, this modern. was impossible. This bone was 68 million years old. So you see this and you think, what? You say, I didn't you want say, to tell anybody. <laughs> Why? You'd be ridiculed, yes. right? And so I, I said to my technician, OK, do it again. I don't believe it. And yet, in sample after sample, they were there. Things that look suspiciously like flexible, transparent blood vessels. She finally mustered the courage to tell Jack. She said she dissolved the bone away and there were blood vessels. And, you know, I was like shocked. I mean, how could that be? How could that be? That's right. The things Mary was finding inside dinosaur bones. Look at that. Blood vessels and even what seemed to be intact cells pose a radical challenge to the existing rules of science. No, they don't. That organic material can't possibly survive that's, even a million years, that's true. let alone 68 million. That's very true. Mary, Jack, and their team published their B-Rex findings in a series of papers in the journal Science and were promptly attacked. Well, Critics said science. their samples might have been contaminated or that the supposed blood vessels were actually something called biofilm, a type of slime. But as Mary showed us, she's been able to replicate her findings. These are pieces of an even older dinosaur, a well-preserved 80-million-year-old duckbill. When she dissolved it away in acid... Let's put this under the scope here. Well, look. Is that a blood vessel? This is a blood vessel. You're you see the branches right there? And look at all of them. And it's so consistent over and over and over again. We do this bone and it comes out and I get excited every time. I can't help it. I mean... 80 million years old. Yeah. Mary published her new results last year, and while some of her critics have been swayed, the controversy still rages, and the stakes are high. If blood vessels can survive 80 million years, what about DNA? You hear the problem with their worldview? Their worldview is forbidding them to believe what their eyes are showing them. The actual laboratory science. It has been confirmed over and over and over again by other laboratories. This is the B-Rex. This is that bone that was cracked open. Here it is. These are her own slides. Right there. And they keep finding it. In fact, it's getting to the point that's like any time they dig up a fossil, they're like, let's break it open. Because we want to see what it's inside. Because it's just, it just keeps, I mean, it's unending. guy named Brian Thomas, I've mentioned him a few times, works for the Institute of Creation Research. He got to do a little bit of work with Mary Schweitzer as he got his PhD in paleobiochemistry. That'll get you a date on Friday night right there, yeah. There's a... <laughs> paleobiochemistry from Liverpool and studied this stuff, published his PhD thesis. We carry it. We tell kids it's a coloring book. Um, so then, no. No, it's, it's actually, it's got some parts you can't understand. It's actually pretty good. But, I mean, if you're wanting the in-depth stuff on this, it's phenomenal. Because he has shown, he did his, this is what he did his PhD on, was all this stuff. And he showed it over and over and over again. We keep finding collagen and all this stuff. And it cannot last for millions of years unless stored in liquid nitrogen at negative 320 degrees Fahrenheit. Guess how many fossils we find in liquid nitrogen? To last... A million years. He said, our experiments have also measured the reality of collagen decay. The presence of collagen in fossils in its too rapid decay rate exclude millions of years for fossils and thus for the vast rock layers that hold them. It's impossible for that stuff to be in there if they're millions of years old. 116 peer-reviewed papers have been published showing soft tissue original ancient biomaterials in these creatures, peer-reviewed, so it's not just stuff that's made up. And it's funny, some of it they measure to be two and a half billion years old. You talk about faith. To hold to your worldview when the science is screaming at you. Right before your very eyes. And then in 2020, oh, this was, remember what Jack said? Oh, we'll never find DNA. 
That's way too brittle. There's no, what did they say about finding the soft tissue? No way, never find it. We'll never find DNA. It's way too fragile. Guess what they found? 20 to In a hypacrosaurus, I believe it is. This little hadrosaur duck build there. They did the study on it. These little parts showing up. Little, little pieces of DNA. Can we make a dinosaur? Can we make a dinosaur, please? It always starts off fun, you know? Everybody's ooh and ah, and then later there's running and screaming. You know, but it's... You know. <laughs> so, you know, no, we can't, okay? There's not enough to sequence like that, okay? But Dr. Sarfati of Creation Ministries, who has a PhD in chemistry, he's like, okay, there's no way that DNA could last the evolutionary time since dino extinction. They're figures of the time to a complete disintegration of DNA, like it'd be completely gone, 22,000 years, or 131,000 years, or 882,000 years, if you keep it at 5 degrees Celsius. At negative 5, it might, might, if you have it in it locked up in a laboratory, to keep it at negative 5 degrees Celsius, you might get 6.8 million years. That's only a tenth of how old these things are supposed to be. And that's if you keep it in cryogenics. What's the logical, rational, reasonable explanation for this stuff? It's not that old. Maybe, say, 4,300 years old, when these fossils got buried with lots of, brought by lots of, very, to preserve it. It could possibly last that long. 4,300 years but definitely not millions. So cool is some of the stuff they found. They're now finding these things, and, and this actually goes back for a long time. They find them almost mummified sometimes, so preserved because of their rapid burial and preservation. This one, its internal organs were fossilized. You can see them in this notosaur. And in fact, some of the keratin was preserved, the stuff on the shell, on its back, you know, these have the big armored backs on them, to the point that for the first time in 2017, they were able to figure out what, hold yourself, what color it was. We actually know the color of an actual dinosaur. Anybody else excited? Yeah. <laughs> you want to see what color it was? Yeah. Are you ready? Okay, Are you, you, you want to see it? Are you ready? Here it is. Here it comes. It was rusty. That's okay. I think it looks cool, don't you? But we actually, because of material that should not be there, if it's millions of years old, but if it was only thousands of years, as the Bible shows us, it would be there. Wait, 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 wait. Only thousands. Only thousands. What did we talk about last night? You remember that whole thing called carbon-14 dating? It only works on things up to, anybody remember? 50,000 years old, give or take. Wait a minute, wait. What could we, what could we maybe do to dinosaur fossils then? We could carbon date them if they're only thousands. Wouldn't that be fun to do? Have you heard of this guy named Jack Horner? Okay, some of you paid attention. Okay, um, this guy named Jack Horner did all the Jurassic Park movies? Well, this guy named Bob Inyart for a radio program in Denver gathers $10,000 to send to Jack so he'll do a carbon-14 test on that one that they found the soft tissue in. Never hears from him. Gathers up almost $24,000 to give to him. It doesn't even cost that to do it. And he says, you can keep the rest of the money for your museum or whatever you want to do. We just want you to do the test. To carbon date it. Never hears from it. Calls him one time, live on his radio program, actually gets through to his office. And Jack talks to him live on the radio about this topic. <laughs> you want to hear what Jack had to say about this? Um, let, let, me, let me tell you where I'm coming from here. Sure. All right? Obviously, your group is a group of creationists. Yes. And, and, um, and the spin they can get off of it, right. doing it, is well, not going to help us. Yeah. So even though it's just a scientific test, they're, they're not no, asking it's, for it's voodoo not a, It's not actually a scientific test. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Carbon-14 dating something with soft tissue in it. <laughs> it. 
it's not a sign. Why is that? If I were Jack, and this guy has offered me tens of thousands of dollars, why wouldn't I take this, this silly, creacious money, do the test, and shut these guys up forever? Unless he knows. Guess what has been done? Several groups have been able to acquire many dinosaur fossils from all and other fossils, all up and down the entire geologic column, and taken them in. This is the one that Brian Thomas and Vance Nelson did, and had them tested four different laboratories, top electromagnetic spectrometer uh, laboratories in the nation. And guess what came back in every single sample? Carbon-14. In every single one. Brian Thomas did, did a, a whole bunch of more samples lately. And guess what came back? Every single one of them. Meaning that the science says that every one of these creatures is what? Thousands of years old, not millions. Which worldview does that support? I almost drove off the interstate, terrified Bob, when, and that's the last time he let me drive, uh, when we were going down to Dallas, when our colleague Matt, he's the president of our ministry, was reading some of this as we were heading down to ICR one time, and he reads me this paragraph of Brian's, and this was, this was peer-reviewed for his PhD thesis at Liverpool, and published, and he got his PhD, and he exposed the fact that several materials presumed as carbon dead, anything over 50,000 years, how much carbon-14 should there be in it? Okay. Routinely tested in searches for machine blanks, but they consistently show percent modern carbon values well within the detection limits of the modern devices. Such data are routinely attributed to contamination, but contamination should be isolated, rare, and not ubiquitous like it appears to be. Guess how many things they have ever tested and it came up negative for carbon-14? In the words of the eloquent Aaron Davis, Woo! <laughs> Boom shakalaka! Man! I could not believe that. This was peer-reviewed. There has never been anything found that didn't have it in it. This battle of worldviews. We cannot have revival in churches if we don't start getting our worldview aligned with this. This is what's hindering it. The great Richard Dawkins was interviewed for... Um, PBS Nova, Bill Myers says, is evolution a theory, not a fact? And Richard Dawkins said, evolution has been observed. It's just that it hasn't been observed while it's happening. <laughs> he, he explains, he explains. Circumstantial evidence, but masses of circumstantial evidence. Huge quantities of circumstantial evidence. It might as well be spelled out in words in English. Evolution is true. I mean, it's as circumstantial as that, but it's as true as that. <laughs> Dr. Frank Sherwin of ICR, he said this at one of the conferences. He said, evolution is a faith that unknown chemicals came together in an unknown way, at an unknown place, at an unknown time, using an unknown process to produce life. That's your alternative. We have taken up the challenge Jesus gave us in John 3.12, these three nights. And we have looked at the earthly things that this book lays claim to. And what have we found? They're absolutely true. So if we can believe the things we can see with our eyes that this book tells us about, then what else can we believe? The things we can't yet see. So can we believe the Bible when it tells us that God created this universe in six days around 6,000 years ago? 
Absolutely, there's nothing to say that didn't happen. Can we believe it when it shows us that humans and dinosaurs walk the earth together? Absolutely, there's no evidence to suggest otherwise. Can we believe it when it talks about this great global flood of judgment? Yes, we can. We've seen mountains, literally, of evidence to support that. So then, can we believe it when it tells us that God loved us so much, He was willing to do whatever it took to save us, even giving us His own Son? Can we believe it when it tells us that? Yes, we can. And so we can believe it then when it says, if you will repent, place your faith in Him, and be immersed in the name of Jesus Christ, the gift of the Holy Spirit of forgiveness and eternal life. Can we believe it when it gives us those promises? How amazing is your Bible? How amazing is the Creator God who gave it to us? Father, thank you for your gift, the gift of this holy, beautiful, inspired book that has the answers to this life. Father, may we not look at it, though, as this, as this answer book, but as this book that contains the mind and heart of our Creator and His passion for us so that we don't just walk around the planet thinking we have the answers, but we have a conviction of what has been done for us. Oh, thank you for Jesus, the Creator who put on flesh and came and dwelt amongst His creation so He could provide the sacrifice it takes to redeem His creation and then rose again to defeat that ultimate enemy of death. Lord, we can't wait for tomorrow. We get to come and praise your name as the church, the body and bride of Christ for the victory we have in Jesus. May it spark revival in our families. May that lead to revival within the church. And may that lead to incredible evangelism as we take this good news of salvation and hope and joy in the midst of a horrific world at times. But it's a message of the assurance of a life eternal with the Creator who loves us beyond measure. Lord, bring revival and let it start in me. May that be our prayer as we ask it and we make the commitment in Jesus' name. And those who want revival said. Mike's going to be leading us in our invitation. He's making his way up. And folks, the most important thing is to know Jesus as Lord and to live for Him and to serve Him, to honor Him, and to realize that uh, the Bible says, God says, I'm not saying it, I'm just repeating what He said, but I'm telling you, He's right in everything that He says. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. And the Bible goes on to tell us why. It's because they're corrupt. And I'm going to tell you what, we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But God cares for us and He wants us. All we have to do is look up. Look down, look around. We can see that God is a God of orderliness and a God of design. Things did not just happen by themselves. God has made Himself known. And a lot of times people say, well, I believe... I believe in Abraham, and I believe in Isaac, I believe those are real people. I believe in Jacob, and I believe in uh, Joseph, and Moses, and... But you know what? They struggle with Genesis chapter 1 through chapter 11. And folks, listen, if we don't believe Genesis 1 through 11, there's no sense believing Genesis 12 through Revelation 22. 
Everything is true in God's Word, including those key chapters that tell us about what God did to make this world. Let me tell you what, there's a God in heaven who's on the throne, and one day every one of us are going to see Him. We'll see His Son come back. I want to be ready. Anybody with me? Let's all stand together as we sing. Years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified, knowing not it was for me. that wonderful to serve him to to have him reveal himself to us and what he's done for us it's marvelous it's magnificent to see what scripture has to say and what God has done our God is good all the time time. God is good absolutely Ryan thank you thank you for sharing with us tonight I'm going to ask Dean Jackson, would you mind coming forward tonight to have a closing prayer? And that way we have you on live stream. And uh, once you, as he's coming forward, let me just mention something about him. I'll mention it tomorrow. I'm going to mention it now. Come on up. He's getting ready to have surgery here on the 23rd of this month. Um, I've got to go in with his neck, um, laminectomy. Is that right? And uh, it's serious with the stenosis that's in his spine that's causing problems with, his, with numbness in his fingertips and shudders down the back of his body and just some different issues going on. I want to encourage you to be in prayer for our brother Dean. He will be going in the Wednesday before Thanksgiving down at New Albany. And please be in prayer for him as uh, he has that done, that everything goes well. Let's pray. Father, we bow in humility before you. You are God. You have spoken this universe into existence just as your word tells us. Father, I thank you for the the night that we've been able to share. Thank you for Ryan and and the study he's put in and being able to share with us uh, the truth of your word, the truth from history, um, your history, our history, all history. Thank you for the opportunity to be here tonight. Thank you for for your grace. Thank you for your son. Thank you for your word that speaks to us, your truth. Thank you for the opportunity you've given us to gather as one body. Thank you for the grace that we have through Jesus and his sacrifice. Bless us tonight, and I pray, Father, that, that as we leave, our time together has been a blessing to you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's close with 80. I stand in awe. You are beautiful beyond description.
majesty enthroned above and I stand I stand in all of you I stand I stand in all of you holy God to whom all praise is due I stand